Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. I don't know, the Lord's just been putting that on my heart to share for a couple weeks now. And actually, the Lord's blessed me, let me think even up to next week what we're going to talk about. I like it when I know a week ahead. It doesn't always happen the way. Sometimes it's Saturday night. And uh, it usually changes it on Saturday night. It's like, oh, okay, I guess this will be a late night. But uh, today, as you can see in your handout, it's going to be Forgive and Forget, the 10 things you need to know about forgiveness. Uh, now, next week, the title of the message will be Obstacle or Opportunity. So uh, I'm excited about that. And, and uh, I don't talk about last time stuff a lot, but uh, we will be getting into the last days uh, next week. So we'll be talking about that. So we'll be sure to be here. And, uh, it's not necessarily a prophetic type message, but we are going to be talking about where we are in, in the scheme of things right now. Okay? So, you have ten points. I had nine points, and I told Cheryl, so I got nine points. So I'd like to have ten, and the Lord was gracious and gave me a tenth point. So, we have ten points this morning, and so if I spend three minutes per point, that would be thirty minutes. If I spend four minutes per point... But don't get nervous if I start off spending 10 minutes on one point because we may just spend a minute on the rest of them or something of that nature. Uh, we'll just see how the Lord orchestrates it this morning. So number one, unforgiveness can majorly hinder our walk with God. You know, unforgiveness is a poison. And it's affected many, many Christians. And it can affect our walk with God. Many times, unforgiveness will cause us to walk in anger. It will cause us to walk in bitterness. Sometimes we may not even realize we're harboring feelings of unforgiveness until somebody comes up and touches it by something they say. Or something that will happen that will bring it to the surface. And all of a sudden, we'll realize that there's unforgiveness in our lives. And there's... There's things that we need to deal with and that we need to take care of. And church, this is a profound point. Simple but profound. The only, uh, uh, the only way to overcome unforgiveness is to forgive. It's pretty much that simple. The only way to overcome unforgiveness is to forgive. Number two, forgiveness is in many ways, the foundation of Christianity. I mean, Christianity is based on forgiveness. Jesus came and died on a cross that we might be forgiven. And that is the only way that we can have a relationship with God is if we're forgiven. And the only way we can be forgiven is to ask God for His forgiveness. When we come to Him, we say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I thank you for dying for my sin. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your salvation. I thank you for making an eternity in heaven for me because of what you've done for me. And that's the whole foundation of Christianity. And then not only did he do that for us, but we'll see here shortly that he calls us to do the same for each other. As I have forgiven you, so you should forgive others. Amen? So forgiveness in many ways is a foundation of Christianity. In Ephesians 4 and verse 32, it reads, and be kind to one another. Do you realize how much better the church would be if we just follow his instructions? Amen? Be kind to one another. Do you know how many? Now, I realize, as far as I know, everybody in this church is pretty much kind to each other. Okay? Um, but you know, there's some churches that's just not true. There are some churches people are, are mean. To each other, and uh, that's that, that's not following the instructions of the Word of God. Jesus says, or the, Paul says here in the Word of God, be kind to one another. Listen, to tender-hearted. You know what the opposite of tender-hearted is? Hard-hearted. And if, because of unforgiveness, we can harden our hearts, not just toward that person that has offended us, but we can harden our hearts against a whole slew of people. Because it's like a cancer. It's a bitter root that just 
begins to uh, uh, take up ground and it takes up not only that one relationship but it affects a lot of relationships it causes distrust and, and so many different things because we are harboring unforgiveness in our hearts be kind to one another tender hearted listen forgiving one another forgiving one another again these are the instructions of the word of God and we not only need to take the Word of God seriously, but as someone once said, we need to take it, or not only literally, we need to take it seriously. And we need to, uh, the whole idea of studying the Word of God, the whole idea of me getting up here and preaching and teaching you on Sunday mornings is not just so that you can hear something, oh, okay, I learned something, that's nice, but there's this thing called applying it. That's the whole idea is to apply it to our lives. And we don't need to talk, oh, you know, so-and-so needs to hear this. No, what can I get out of this? How can I apply this message, this verse of Scripture, whatever it may be? How can I apply it to my life? And that's when you really begin to grow as a Christian. It's not until you start realizing the Word of God, whether you hear it from your pastor on Sunday morning or reading it on Monday morning, is to take that Word and apply it to your life. So it goes on to say, forgive you one another. Listen, even as God in Christ forgave you. God in Christ forgave you of, of so many things. Me, of so many things. Forgiveness is, this is so important. If you don't know this, this could set you free. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision. You may never get over the feeling, to be honest with you. But you can make a decision. I think I shared this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about dirty feet. I can't remember, I still don't remember her name, but she founded the Red Cross. And she was sitting in her office and she, uh, um, uh, uh, her secretary came in and said, so-and-so's here, you want me to send her away? And the lady said, no, go ahead and send her in. She goes, really? After what she did to you? I can't believe you'd even want to talk to her. And this lady said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. And you see, that's the attitude that we have to have. You know, and we'll get into that more here in a couple uh, points later. But forgiveness is a decision. And it's not always easy. You know what they say, it was easy, everybody be doing it. Amen? That's true. That's true. It may not be easy, but it's the best decision we can make is to walk in forgiveness. Forgive quickly. We'll get into that. I'm trying to get ahead of my points here. So, uh, uh, it's the best decision. Number three, basically, forgiveness is releasing your offender and choosing not to retaliate against them. In uh, Matthew 18, 21, listen to what it says. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And notice he said brother. My brother come uh, 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 and sin against me and I forgive him. Up to seven times. Now, now he thought he was being generous, extremely generous. I mean, that is quite a bit, isn't it? You know, I mean, somebody did something seven times in one day. Up to seven times. And, and he answers there in Matthew, but also he answers the same question in Luke 17, 4. And it reads there, And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now, I don't know about you, but that would that would stretch me a little bit. I mean, forgive my once, okay. Twice, you're pushing a little bit. Three times, come on now, really? Four, five, six, seven times in a day, and to forgive them. In other words, what he's saying is you just need to walk in forgiveness. You need to walk in forgiveness. Now, Probably most of us will not have somebody come up and offend us seven times in a day. That somebody will come up and, and do something that we would have to forgive them seven times in a day. But I tell you what you might have to deal with seven times in a day is that thought of what they did coming to you. That's what you might have to deal with seven times in a day. And every time that thought comes, you have to say to that thought, I distinctly remember forgiving them of that. And when that thought comes back again, say, I remember forgiving them of that. And every single time, 
just proclaim that you have forgiven that person for whatever they did. Every time that thought comes up, we have a choice to make. Yeah, I hate that person. Yeah, I'd just like to get even with that person. They, they ought to get what they deserve. Or we can say, I forgive them. Or actually, I forgave them. I forgave them. In Matthew 5.25, listen to what it says there. Agree with your adversary quickly. Everybody say quickly. Quickly. Quickly, while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. You know, it isn't always easy to humble yourself and try to reconcile. That takes the bigger man, the bigger woman, doesn't it? To say, you know what, I realize I've been done wrong, but you know, I am not going to hang on to this. I'm not going to live with this. I choose to forgive that person in Jesus' name. And if you don't, what happens is you build your own prison. You know, how's that saying? I always hate to, to think it through. I'll get in the middle of some gliding how it goes. But basically what it is, you're letting them live in your mind rent free. You know, that's something like that. They're living in your mind rent free. And uh, you know, the thing is with most people, it's bothering you way more than it's bothering them. That's true. Yeah. So you don't only forgive to release them, but to release yourself from your own prison sentence by holding on to that bitterness and anger. Number four. Now this is so true. You can save a lot of emotion by forgiving quickly. You can save a lot of emotion. You know, unforgiveness takes up a lot. It's expensive emotion. In uh, Colossians 3.13, it reads there, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, there it is again, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. You know, church, that's not just talking about minor offenses either. That's talking about major offenses. And I'm, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that's easy to make a choice to forgive somebody of a major offense. But again, I will stand here and tell you that's the best choice for you. That is the best choice for you. With everything in you, you need to get yourself to that place so that you can be free from that bondage of unforgiveness. And we're told to forgive as the Lord God forgave. You know, Jesus Christ was hanging there on the cross. Think about what all that He had been through. What was one of the last things He said? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And like I said the other day, sometimes I feel like saying, but they do know what they did. Yeah, they <laughs> but they're just deceived by the enemy and being used by the enemy to hinder your walk with God. So we need to forgive quickly. And we need to save a lot of emotion by forgiving quickly. Number five. Forgiveness is not only important in this life and how it will affect you, but it's also uh, important in eternity. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, listen to how it reads there. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for. Now this is talking about eternal rewards. It says you can lose those things you work for. But that we receive a full reward. I don't know about you, but I don't want a full reward when I get to heaven. I don't want to lose something because I harbored unforgiveness. And it's telling us we can lose rewards because we hang on to unforgiveness. You know, it's hindering your walk and what you're doing for the Lord. You know, we have such a short amount of time to do something for God today. I don't care if you live to be 100 years old. You know, if I live to be 100 years old, that is just 47 more years. I'm telling you, this first 51 years went by pretty fast. Or 53, sorry. My math's getting off there. I'm just trying to make myself younger. <laughs> 53 years has gone by like that. So if I have another 40, 50 years, that's not going to, it's going to be here before you know it. Yeah. I could go home in, 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 in a month. You just, you don't know. You're not promised. Amen. 
I mean, there's martyrs that gave their lives for Jesus. It talks about time being short and how we're to redeem the time. You're not going to redeem the time very well if you're just off somewhere being unforgiving and being in a prison that you built because you refuse to do what the Word of God says to do and release that person so that you can be released. Amen? So don't let unforgiveness cause you to suffer eternal loss. Number six. Okay, now this is, what, this is the, the, the point I like the best. Six and seven. Number six. When God forgives, He completely forgives. In Psalms 103, Verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Now you've probably heard this before, but in case you haven't, or as a reminder, why does it say east from west? Because east and west never meet. North and south will meet up someday. In other words, your, your sins are never going to meet God's remembrance again. Your sins are completely forgiven to be remembered no more as we'll see here in a moment number seven when God forgives not only does he completely forgive but when God forgives he forgets in Isaiah 43 and verse 25 I and I am he who blots out your transgressions listen he says for my own sake See, that's something we can say too. You know, I'm going to blot out your transgression for my own sake. Not just for you, but I'm going to do it for me. And I will not remember your sins. We have a command to forgive. But now I'm going to say something that might surprise you. God says He forgets, but He doesn't command us to forget. You can look, look it up yourself. God commands us to forgive, but He doesn't say you always have to forget. Besides, that's really almost impossible to do, isn't it? You know, you can say I forgive and forget, but you can forgive because that's, that's what? It's a decision. A decision. But you can't make a decision. I mean, you can make a decision not to hold it against them and forget that way, but you can't really make a decision that won't cross your mind again. Because you know, our minds, they don't just blot it out like that. You never remember it again. It just, that just doesn't happen. Has anybody done that? Well, maybe you have a bad memory. Sometimes I can forget things. But <clears throat> we can forget for a certain amount of time, but then something will trigger that emotion. Something that somebody might say or something will happen that will remind you uh, of that situation, that, that person, what they did. You know, even concerning ourselves and forgiving ourselves, we continue to remember. And at times we don't feel forgiven because we remember what we did, but during those times we need to remember that God forgives and forgets. And again, do you really think God forgets? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. No, He chooses to forget. He chooses not to hold it against you. That's the kind of forgetting that it's talking about. And our job is this, to forgive and remember that God forgets. And again, to be honest with you, forgetting is not always a good thing. Oh, it sounds good, doesn't it? You don't say, oh, now we're just forget and forget and just go on and it's like nothing ever happened. I don't think that's good counsel. I'll tell you what I mean here. Look at Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. It reads there, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us shall give account of himself to God. That sounds kind of different, doesn't God forgives and forgets, but it says we're going to give an account. 
Look at verse 13 of uh, Hebrews 14. Hebrews 14, 13. And there's no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account, an account. There's that word again. Then in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done. Listen, whether good or bad. Now, let's think about this for a moment. We hear God forgives and forgets, but it says that we'll give an account. It says that we will appear, that word appear means to be exposed, totally naked. For good or bad. It's all out there. Now, some of us struggle with our past. But it says God forgives and forgets. But then it talks about this giving an account thing. We'll come back next week and we'll finish that up. I will go ahead and go a few more verses. In, in uh, Revelations uh, 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So we see we have these books and everything, everybody say everything. Everything. Everything is written in these books. And these books are going to be open in the last day. What happens here? A book is open and everything we've done is recorded in that book. Are you getting nervous yet? <laughs> now here's the good news. You know, there are some government books with records that you can demand to read. But when you get that book and you open it up, there's going to be certain things that are blacked out. Things that you can't read. You can read the book, but you can't read the parts that are blacked out. What it tells us, He's blacked out our sins. Amen? So when you open that book, your sins have been blotted out. Or you might want to look at this way, they've been blacked out. They're not there. Now, I want to share with you three different kind of books. I really want to try to do an illustration on this. First book, you've never received Jesus Christ, you have not been forgiven of your sins, the book's going to be open, and you're going to see some good things written in the book. But you're probably going to see a lot of bad things. Everything that you've done is going to be written there. You're going to be exposed. You're going to be totally naked before everybody. Everything is going to be read. All the charges against you are going to be read. That's one book. Then there's another book. It's going to have some writing in it. It's going to have a lot of black in it. Because the only thing you're going to read about this person who has accepted Jesus Christ and received forgiveness of sin, you're going to read all the good things. You're going to know they've done some bad things, but you ain't, you're not going to know because it's going to be blacked out. So the only thing you're going to read is Tracy did this wonderful thing. And Tracy did this wonderful thing. But you're not going to see anything that Tracy did if she has been forgiven. So you're going to see some good things and you're going to see some black eyed things. But I'll tell you where a lot of Christians are going to be. There's going to be a book open. It's going to have a lot of blacked out stuff, but the rest of it is just white. Because they haven't done a thing for God. So I don't want a book with just a bunch of black marks in it. Mine's going to have some black marks in it. I guarantee you, mine's going to have some black marks in it. But I'm hoping that as I serve the Lord, that when He opens, there's also going to be some good things to read. And uh, as I've shared before many times, you know, it says as we do good works for Him, we get rewards and crowns. And I said, I want a big, heavy crown. I want to have a lot of help carrying that crown. So whenever I throw it down at His feet, I can say, worthy. What I don't want is what? A Burger King paper crown. Amen. You're worthy, Lord. I don't want a white out page with a bunch of black marks. I want some things written in the book for His glory. Amen to show that I truly believed He was worthy while I lived here on this earth. We take a look at that at a different angle. 
I really wanted to ask a couple people to help me act this out as a skit, but I didn't. I didn't get to you. But you know, we really don't know what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. We can, you know, we can kind of imagine. Like that song says, "I can only imagine." We can only imagine. I mean, there's some things that the Bible tells us, but we really do not know exactly how it's all going. When we stand before the throne, I don't know. How, I mean, I've seen pictures where it's just a mass of people and there's a big throne. And, I mean, but I don't know. Or maybe they just put you in small groups and you go into a room somewhere. And, and you know, I, I don't know exactly how that works. I don't know if it'll be set up like a trial, you know, like a courtroom. Uh, it could be. I don't know. But let's just, for the sake of argument, say it's going to be a courtroom setting. And you have Cheryl, the defendant. And then you have Mark Jr., the accuser. And then you have Mike, who is Jesus. <laughs> so the accuser, Mark, he says, Oh, I got, this is an open shut case. I got tons of evidence against Cheryl. And so he walks up to the judge and he says, Judge, today, Cheryl will face her eternal death because I have so much evidence. Just open the book and take a look. So God, see, 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 Cheryl, Cheryl Yates. And he opens the book. He says, I don't see any charges against her. I don't see any evidence of any sort that she deserves eternal damnation. As far as I can see, there's only good things that Cheryl's done. Things that glorified me. And, and, and Marcus, the devil, says, that can't be. That can't be. How can that be? I know I saw her do it. And God says, enter in <laughs> to your rest, thou good and faithful servant. And then Marcus, the devil, looks to Mike, Jesus. And he says, but Jesus, how can this be? And Jesus says, I died on the cross that Cheryl might be forgiven of her sins. I took her death. I took her punishment. Now she can be free in Jesus' name. You see, that's how it works, church. Talk about grace. Amen? Talk about grace. But then you got Kay. <laughs> who in this scenario never received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. So the judge says, okay, what's the next case? And Marcus, the devil, he don't like me calling him Marcus, but I think that's his new name. <laughs> Mark says, he's kind of downtrodden now because, I mean, look what just happened. I mean, he just, that case was blown to shiverings, Amen. Smithereens, and 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 so Marcus the devil says, "Well, yeah, look up K." So God looks up K. K K K Frazier. Okay K. Okay. He says, "I saw her do it. She did this and she did this. Read the book, God." And God starts going, "Yes, K did this and K did this." And Kay did this and reads down this list and five hours later, you know, <laughs> Kay's a lifetime of sin. <laughs> and most importantly, Kay never accepted Jesus Christ. So Kay, unfortunately, is not forgiven. Depart from me. But I sit in church every Sunday. I had to listen to that preacher every Sunday. Depart from me. But, but, I, but I, I, I've got the communion together. Every Sunday. I gave money to the church every Sunday. Depart from me. You work her in that way. It's hard to say that about Kay. But... <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand the reality? Has anybody ever seen that presentation, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames? You know, there's like scenario after scenario of people who stand before God. Some enter in because they have made a decision to accept Jesus Christ and what He did for them upon the cross. Amen? And if you're here and you have not made that decision, 
You're like K in our illustration. You come to church, that's not going to save you. Your mama's a Christian, your daddy's a Christian, that's not going to save you. You're baptized, that's not going to save you. Have you yourself made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you said, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. Forgive me. Make me new. If you haven't, there's coming a day. You'll sit in that courtroom or however that scenario plays out. And the books will be open. And either your sin will blot it out or it will not. That is reality. Amen? Okay. Hallelujah. So, Marcus, the devil says, that ain't fair. And Jesus says, I don't care. <laughs> but don't have a blank page either. Amen? Let's make this life count. All that you do, do for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, it tells us in Corinthians, do it for the glory of God. Okay, let's move on. Number eight. Forgetting for us can, can be a bad thing. Forgetting, now we're commanded to forgive, right? But forgetting can be a bad thing. Sometimes we forget when we should remember. Now, Personally, I'm not a grudge holder. It's hard for me to stay mad at somebody. My daughter, or actually, I, I got that from my mom. You know, my mom could just, you know, no time forgive and go on and, and be doing tons of stuff with that same person who, who did something to her. And Charity, my daughter, kind of is like that, like I am. You know, just, you know, just not, not, not a grudge holder. You know, just kind of gets on past it and and goes on. <clears throat> so uh, that can be a bad thing. I mean, it can be a good thing, but it can also be uh, not such a good thing. The downside is I only remember the good of that person. And that can set me up for repeat offenses. You see, I, I don't see that person for who they really are and what they can really do to me. And let me just say this, you can, and I'll say it again here in a little bit, but this is a good spot to say it. You know, you can forgive somebody, but that doesn't mean you have to continue to have a relationship with that person. It doesn't mean you have to still be best buddies. You can forgive without continuing a relationship. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as you do it the right way. You see, I'm the kind of person, I just want to put it behind you. I want it to be water under the bridge. I, I don't like awkward moments, you know. I just want to forgive them and, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> if I see them out, smile at them and, you know, if I don't want to lie, I mean, I said, good to see you. You know, how you doing? <laughs> but I, I don't want to hold a grudge. You know, I want it to be water under the bridge. Uh, now, when, when is it the best time not to forgive? Or forget when they have not made an attempt to change for one thing they haven't asked to be forgiven now you need to forget whether they ask to be forgiven or not but you don't necessarily have to forget if they haven't asked to be forgiven okay you know there are good people or there are people that are not good for us and God doesn't call us to to spend our time with people like that. There are what's called toxic relationships where they just people that poison you. I mean, they're always putting you down. They're always, uh, uh, you know, trying to say something to make you feel guilty or bad. Or, you know, those are not the kind of relationships that we need to continue with people. Now, if it's your husband or wife, that's a whole different story, okay? You're called for better or for worse. You know, uh, you can't. You, you, you need to stay in that relationship and, and work things out. Amen. Get some counseling. Uh, you know, work it out. Um, <clears throat> forgetting could be a good thing. <coughs> On the opposite side of the coin, those who forget 
or uh, too easily. There are those who refuse to forget. And they just hang on to it. And they just hold a grudge. They keep a record of wrongs. I've seen people before come in with a list. I've had people who had a list against me. You know, they just they just wanted to have them in a big old list. We should strive to forget when it's good to forget. Especially if somebody comes up and says, hey, I'm sorry, would you please forgive me? And not just lip service, but you can see that they're trying to reconcile that relationship. And they're doing things to make it work. And we say, well, I don't care how you did this. I'll never forget what you did. I forgive you, but I won't forget. See, that's the wrong attitude, amen? So we need to strive to forget when it's good to forget and uh, when somebody's taking steps toward reconciliation. And see, that's the goal, church, to be reconciled. God wants us to be reconciled to one another, to love one another, to forgive one another, uh, to be with one another. But that sometimes can only happen after the offender has taken the responsibility for at least some of it and has asked for forgiveness and they made an attempt to make restoration with action. Amen? Words are cheap. But when you see action, that's whenever it's okay. We'll try again. My last point. I'm going to close this one with a little story. People can change, but it takes time to rebuild a relationship. People can change, but it takes time to build a relationship. I can remember one time, and I won't, of course, give names or locations or anything of that nature. But I was counseling with a couple. There's nobody you know. And one of the spouse, one of the spouses, went out and had like three affairs right after the other. And I was talking to them. And the one who had the affairs said, I repeat, I said I'm sorry. You just keep remembering it. And she didn't say exactly that way. And she thought because she said she was sorry that he should just go on like nothing ever happened. The trust factor should be right there again simply because she said she was sorry. That person's trust is not going to return overnight. It takes time to rebuild trust. As I was talking to Cheryl a little bit about this message, I said, you know, I've never felt I would be tempted to be in a situation like that. I said, now it's almost laughable <laughs> that I'll be in a position. But you know, what's taken years to build up integrity can be lost in a moment's time. And it will take months and even years to build that trust back up after we betrayed somebody. But this person who was sitting before me felt like because she said she was sorry that that should take care of it. You know what she needs to see? Some action. She needs to see some action. And although that is on the most intimate level of betrayal, we get betrayed by friends. We get betrayed by church members. We get betrayed in so many different ways. Somebody we work with, perhaps. Sometimes, or all the time, that trust level takes time. But if both parties are willing to work toward that, the ultimate goal is reconciliation. That's what brings pleasure to God. Amen? When both are working toward that reconciliation. And sometimes that won't happen. 
But even during those times, we are called to forgive. And like I said before, we're not always called to continue that relationship. There are some relationships that are best left separ separated. But when we can, we need to reconcile. Amen? And those are just ten things that you need to know about forgiveness. And I know that we could come back next week come up with ten more. That's a start. Amen? And uh, I'd encourage you. And, you know, and I know uh, there's people sitting right here. You, you've told me before that you held unforgiveness for somebody for a lot of years and you made that decision to forgive. And you told me, now I'm not going to call names out. That was a testimony at another time. But you told me that that released you. And that made you feel so much better. And church, that's the real deal. When you make that decision to forgive, it releases you more so than it releases that person. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I know that every issue of life is addressed in your word. And Lord, we've addressed the issue of unforgiveness this morning. And Lord, I know that even in a room this size, there are issues. Some may be minor, some major, but Lord, you want us to be set free from all the effects of unforgiveness. So Lord, I pray that everybody listening to the sound of my voice this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be released today from the bondage of unforgiveness. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to make that decision to forgive today. And Lord, I also pray that where possible, you would restore relationships. And where it's not possible, that you would help us, Lord, to make that decision every time, whether it be seven times in a day, to say, I forgave. And I choose not to remember. And Lord, I thank you for giving us the strength to follow your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives inside us and empowers us to be obedient to your instructions. And Lord, we're careful to give you all the praise for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. And uh, remember, next week, obstacle or opportunity.